much more anatomical view. We have more spatial resolution. We have less temporal resolution. But this is the most current uh, imaging technique that we have. With this, we can see all the structures of the heart. You will see later on how we acquire as this is 2D, and of course the heart is 3D, we have to use the integration of different uh, imaging views that we will see later on. But as I have said, the heart is a moving uh, target, and there is uh, tissue which is made by the myocardium and the, and the pericardium and the, and the valves, but also we have fluid inside, which is the blood. So we can also have information for the echoes that are reflected by the um, particles within the, the moving particles within the blood, which are the red blood cells or the white blood cells. So we have information also applying the, uh, the Doppler principle. We have also information about the speed of the motion of this uh, blood within the heart. And for that, we have different modalities of Doppler, what we call the pulse Doppler and the continuous wave Doppler. Uh, you may know better than me, but pulse wave uh, Doppler means that you send uh, a pulse and you wait to have the echoes back. Uh, so you have, uh, you, can, you can scan fluids with low velocities, typically less than 1.5 meters per second, but you can localize very well where is that flow moving. On the other hand, we have continuous wave Doppler, which means that the transducer is sending and receiving at the same time uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasounds on the reflected echoes. So that means that you can uh, evaluate high velocity flows, but you are not, this is not good to locate where is exactly the flow. And these two uh, uh, techniques or these two modalities are useful to evaluate velocities of flow inside the heart. We, we can also, uh, we will, later on we will talk about the application of the Doppler to the tissues also. And what do we use this for? For example, we can use this pulse wave Doppler to see how fast or how slow the blood enters the left ventricle. And this gives us a lot, a lot of information. Because as Bart explained previously, we have an early passive feeling of the heart so just looking at the velocity of this uh, wave and also particularly at the speed of the deceleration of this wave, I mean how it decelerates, we can imply from here lots of information on how the stiffness of the, of the ventricle and how is the flow, if it is overloaded or not or underfilled. <laughs> also, there is another part of feeling which is due to atrial contraction and this is what we call the A wave. And this gives a lot of information, again, of how, how is uh, not only uh, ventricular uh, conditions like stiffness or compliance, but also about atrial uh, function or atrial contraction. Continuous wave Doppler is mainly applied to look at flows with high velocities. Um, flows with high velocities is what we got when we have um, 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 narrow valves, for example, in valve stenosis. So there are some diseases that cause narrowing of the valves or other abnormal uh, malformation, congenital uh, abnormalities that do uh, narrowing of the place where the flow should go out. And for those, we have velocities of flow that go beyond three meters per second. So we need continuous wave Doppler to scan those flows. These applications are really, really important because before Doppler echocardiography came in, we had to put a catheter inside the heart to evaluate these diseases. Now we do that non-invasively, just applying a transthoracic echocardiography, which is a cheap, easily available, and uh, an expensive test. So this was really a revolution in the field of cardiac imaging and in the field of, of cardiology. Another uh, modality or derived from pulse wave Doppler is color Doppler. I always tell my medicine students, this is echo for doctors who are less uh, smart than engineers. So they put colors to us so we can understand it better. So this is uh, another way to depict uh, velocities of, uh, of, of, the, of the blood. And um, 
by agreement, we just, as you know, the normal flow within the heart is laminar. So mainly we, we see uh, um, velocities, uh, similar velocities in and, and laminar flow. And by agreement, we say that it is red when it goes uh, um, towards the transducer, which is here. So, and it is blue when uh, it goes uh, away from the transducer. So this is a normal flow across the mitral valve, which is when the valve, mitral valve, which is this one opens, the flow gets into from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And as we have the transducer here, we see it depicted in red color, okay? If we could stop, we could see that that is exactly in diastole after the uh, exact moment in, in the cardiac cycle. When we have abnormal flows, this flow becomes turbulent and we have no more uh, laminarity. The flow increases velocity and it goes beyond what the pulse wave Doppler can do, which is, as I told you, is usually around one meter second. So it happens this thing that you know better than me that is aliasing and the machine depicts it as a mosaic of colors. And this is the thing that we have uh, to look at, the mouse doesn't work. Okay, um, do you have a pointer? So we have this, uh, the, this mosaic colors here that depict that there is a turbulent flow. Looking at when it happens during the cardiac cycle, this is systole, my eye is trained, so I can see it systole, and it goes from the right ventricle to the right atria. So this means that this is an incompetence of the tricuspid valve that doesn't close adequately during systole and then flow goes from the right ventricle to the atria, uh, to the right atria. So this is how we diagnose regurgitations or abnormal flows. Just taking advantage of this Nyquist effect and of, thank you, and of the appearance of this turbulent flow here in a moment of the cardiac cycle. We also have now, uh, and with some more technical progress, we will have more and more, as I have said, we have a three-dimensional structure, which is the heart, that we evaluate with two-dimensional echo. That's our main clinical tool in daily clinical routine practice. But currently we have, in many systems, we have also the advent of 3D echocardiography. This is an example of three transthoracic three-dimensional echocardiography. So with the use of, of, of transducers that have many crystals in a matricial disposition, we can take a whole volume of the heart, and even now in one bit, we can have the whole volume at least of a normal ventricle. And this is useful mainly to look for better uh, spati uh, spatial re um, relationships and also to estimate volumes of the, left vent of the heart cavities ventricles and, and also atria. This is a still not so used in clinical routine practice. Why? Because technology is still not so good and we still have limited spatial resolution and of course very limited temporal resolution. So we can use that for research. We may use in clinical, in few patients where we have good window with good images, but this is not really still a state of the art clinical routine practice. We also have it with uh, applied to another modality that we will talk, which is transesophageal echocardiography. So with transesophageal echocardiography, uh, we are closer to the heart, so we can have a better visualization of the cardiac structures. And then we use, uh, th this is where 3D is really, really useful to look uh, precisely at the valves and also to help, uh, to help interventionists to treat these valves. This is what we do in the OR, for example, uh, helping cardiac surgeons to see if the repair in the valves they have done works appropriately or not. And particularly, this is really, really useful in the cath lab where cardiologists with catheters try to put things around the valves and they try to fix uh, valves without opening the chest of the patient just by the use of catheters. And one limitation that we had, for example, when we used to the echocardiography is that it's very important to look where is the tip of the catheter they use. 
this was really, really difficult to do with 2D echocardiography, while with 3D, I'm sorry that I don't have an image here, but we can see it very nicely. So you can see here, for example, this is a mitral valve. This is a segment of the mitral valve which is prolapsing, and as you can see, there are two lines which are not any artifact. These are cordia tendine that are ruptured. So the definition with transesophageal echocardiography is pretty good to see particularly the tip of these linear structures uh, the same way that we see uh, the catheters. And of course, with these volumes of data, you can do lots of processing that you love to do and that probably Mathieu will uh, develop uh, tomorrow. Another modality that we, that we use, uh, and we also use in clinical routine practice, not, not as much as we should, but we, we already use, is the application of the Doppler uh, principle. As we said, we use that for calculating velocities of the flow or the blood flow, but we can also, uh, uh, changing the, the settings of the machine, and this is already a, a preset that comes with every machine, we can evaluate the velocities of the myocardium uh, because, as I have said, the heart is a moving, a moving organ. So we can uh, evaluate the velocities uh, with which the myocardium moves. So we, we, we know the velocities that the myocardium moves in regards to the transducer, and we can do that mainly applying the Doppler. As I have said, this is what we call Doppler tissue imaging. And typically, we can have pulse wave doubler uh, that we use uh, usually to evaluate the annular velocities. That gives us an idea of the global longitudinal deformation of the heart, which is a surrogate of the ventricle of the function, uh, of the, the contractile function of the heart, as Bart already mentioned. But we can also use these acquisitions where we have color-coded velocities of the myocardium, and from here, we can later on post-process with the specific softwares, and from here we can have different sample volumes in the different regions of the myocardium and look on how the heart, uh, how, um, how fast or how, uh, what's the velocity of the myocardium moving across cardiac, the cardiac cycle. So typically we have this motion in systole towards, towards the apex, and then we have the two waves, the E wave and the A wave, the same thing that we look for filling. So we have the early relaxation of the ventricle and then the atrial contra contraction that also makes the heart to move uh, away from the, from the transducer, which is here. From this Doppler imaging, uh, color imaging, we can also have velocity, as I have said. This is the raw data. But from this, we can derive other parameters, which is displacement and particularly strain rate. Uh, Bart already went to, to the concept of what is the, the, the velocity of the formation of the myocardium, and also we can have a strain and global strain. DTI mainly we use clinically to analyze the velocities of the annulus, and uh, sometimes we use to evaluate a strain and a strain rate, particularly for hypertrophic myocardial disease. But as I have said, the main application is for looking at velocities of the annulus. More recently, uh, another modality to evaluate the for myocardial deformation of the heart was developed. This, uh, as somebody says, this is kind of easier for doctors or for physicians but it's probably less accurate because it has less temporal resolution than tissue Doppler. But this is definitely more friendly to use for physicians, despite not so precise from the engineering point of view or the technical point of view. So here, what we do, uh, or what the machine, the software does, is track the, mm, the nature speckles that we have in the myocardium when you insonate it. You have these bright points within the myocardium, the system tracks them across the uh, cardiac cycles, and it gives you the longitudinal deformation, also the circumferential deformation uh, in, the, in another view, in, in another transversal view of the heart, and from these two provides you the radial deformation of the heart, which are, as mentioned in the previous talk, the three directions on which the heart is, is moving through across the cardiac cycle. 
So from this, we can calculate the global deformation of the, of the left ventricle, also of the atria on the right. We can estimate the regional or the deformation of each segment. And what is more interesting for us is we can look at the pattern of this deformation, not only at the amount of deformation, but also how it deforms across the cardiac cycle. As I have said, this is uh, uh, measuring the formation is something that we uh, still do a lot for research and less for clinical practice, despite we should incorporate it more and more for clinical because it provides you a lot of information. One of the limitations of not using this in clinical practice is that we don't have this available in all the machines. You have to transfer this to a workstation and analyze later on. And you know, physicians are always very busy. They have like 50 patients waiting to do an echo. So you have to, to, to rush to do, to do echocardiography and just keep it to ejection fraction. Indeed, this is something that we do wrong. We have these tools and we should uh, take uh, more advantage of them. Uh, another limitation uh, of this is that sometimes these are concepts difficult to understand for busy physicians, but this is why 2D strain, which is or a spectral striking st strain, has been more successful than DTI because it has less artifacts. It's kind we have a lot of smoothing in this post processing, and this is why it's more friendly for us, and this is why we are now using a little bit more than the tissue Doppler was useful. Okay, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we get echocardiography? As you know, the main uh, access is transthoracic echocardiography. We just put a transducer on top of the chest and uh, we look at the heart. And for that, we have a standardization of different views and different approaches. And from that, we reconstruct from 2D images, but we also incorporate all these techniques, M-mode, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, Doppler echocardiography, tissue Doppler, 3D, if we have 3D, or other things, as you will see. We incorporate all of these techniques in the different views. So we know in each view what we are looking for, what we do is we want to scan in each view, and typically same structure we look it from different uh, views in order to make the 3D reconstruction in our head to complete the evaluation of the heart. So typically we start with the parasternal view here, and then we go to the apical view, and from here with our hand or with the hand of the sonographer, we change the cutting, the cutting planes and we see the different structures. For example, this is a parasternal long axis view, what we call. We can see here the left ventricle, the left atrium, the aorta, and the uh, outflow of the right ventricle. Just by turning the transducer 90 degrees, we have transversal views of the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and also depending on the tilting that we pro give to the, to the probe, we have different cuts at different levels. This is an example of an apical view, the four-chamber apical view. This is kind of the most anatomical one and the easier to understand for those who are not familiar with this. And also we have here the left ventricle, typically larger than the right ventricle in the adult, and the atria here with the mitral and the tricuspid valves. Also by turning the, the probe, we can have a cut across the left cavities with the left ventricle and the left atrium. And this is important because we see different segments of the left ventricle, which is in cardiology kind of the most important, despite the right ventricle is also importing, important, uh, the left ventricle is the most involved in most of the pathologies, at least in the adult, because the most prevalent one is heart, uh, ischemic heart disease, which mainly involves the left ventricle. And it's important to see in all uh, the walls of the left ventricle, because we have three coronary arteries, and the three coronary arteries irrigate different aspects or different parts of the whole left ventricle. So it's important to do this uh, reconstruction of this view of all the parts of the left ventricle, but that also applies to the mitral valve and indeed to all the structures in the heart. So what do, when, what do we do when the heart is not really nicely seen with transthoracic echocardiography? Because you know we have the lungs in, 
in the middle, and you know air is not a good con uh, conductor for the ultrasound, so sometimes we face patients who have a bad window, what we call a bad acoustic window, and we have something to see better the heart. So in that case, we have two options, uh, uh, keeping it with, with echo. So we can give what we call uh, echo contrast. Contrast for echocardiography has nothing to do with other contrast used for other imaging techniques, such, such as radiology or uh, CT, sorry, or MRI. What we use is microbubbles, and we have several types of microbubbles bubbles depending on the size of the bubble. So if we have big bubbles, these bubbles, if you inject them in the vein, when these, bu these bubbles will uh, reach the, the, the lungs, they will be stopped there and they will be uh, destroyed and expirated as air. But if you have very, very small micro bubbles, they will pass the, pulmonar the alveolo uh, pulmonary membranes and they will go through the left circulation. So they will arrive to the right, uh, left atrium and the left ventricle. And what they will do, they will uh, uh, empower the transmission of ultrasound. So you will see like this, the left ventricular cavity. And this has helped a lot us to diagnose and to evaluate uh, LV motion and also LV morphology. Indeed, this was a, a, a side effect of something that they invented to look at myocardial perfusion. They, they invented contrast to look at myocardial perfusion, but this has not really been ve a very successful story. This is one of the big pitfalls of echocardiography. We are not so able to really um, accurately and reproducibly uh, see myocardial perfusion with echocardiography, uh, giving contrast. We can see some perfusion here, but there's a lot of work to do to improve this. But we use it routinely, clinically, to evaluate uh, LV cavity in patients with bad uh, acoustic uh, windows. And also we use the big bubbles, the ones that are stopped in the lung, to look at intracardiac shunts. For example, patients who have a patent for amenovale, which is a congenital structure that typically the two layers of the interatrial septum are closed during fetal life or in the very first days uh, after uh, birth. And in some people, uh, they keep separated. That uh, can be related to some problems, particularly when you are diving. So typically, if we inject con big bubbles in a peripheral vein, they go to the right cavities and they don't pass to the left ventricle, okay? In these patients, as they have a permanent hole here and you put a lot of pressure here when, when you inject the contrast, the bubbles, they pass through the left uh, cavities. So that makes the diagnosis of intracardiac shunt. Other patients have the shunt in the lungs, such as those athletes that Lagerge uh, studied in the slide of, of, of the previous talk. And you see also contrast appearing lately, big bubbles appearing lately in the left cavities. So we use contrast for two things, for detecting shunts and also to enhance the endocardial border of the left ventricle to look at its motion and also at its shape. Another thing is to use transesophageal echocardiography. This is a must in patients who cannot be performed transthoracic echocardiography, like those who are in the operating room, they have the open chest in cardiac, during cardiac surgery, so you cannot do echo, definitely. Uh, you, this is why we use the transesophageal approach. We also use the transesophageal approach when we need to be very precise to look at small structures that are not seen in the transthoracic uh, way, like looking, for example, at the left atrial appendage. If we want to see if there are clots inside, we cannot see that. Uh, accurately with transthoracic echocardiography, so we will use transesophageal echocardiography. And transesophageal echocardiography is nothing else than an endoscope that is put in the esophagus with a probe in its tip. And we put that in the esophagus because the esophagus goes just behind the left atrium. So we can image the heart very nicely from this position. The problem, of course, that is a little bit more uh, uncomfortable for the patient. So we usually have to give some uh, superficial anesthesia because it's not so nice to swallow an endoscope. 
but we use that mm, very uh, every day, every day in ICUs, in the OR, or even in the outpatient, uh, in the outpatient, uh, in the echo lab, we use that for uh, specific diagnosis uh, of uh, cardiac pathology. Again, in 3D, in uh, transesophageal eukaryography, we mainly use two-dimensional eukaryography, and we use different views. Again, instead of looking about the apical or the parasternal, we talk about degrees, but we have the same more or less terminology for chamber, longitudinal or uh, aortic view. So more or less we have the same, the same terminology, but our guide here is the angle with the crystal, of, uh, which, with, with what you move the crystal of the, um, of the transducer of the endoscope. Here we can also apply all the other modalities like color, like chemo, pulse wave, continuous wave, and also three-dimensional echocardiography. Okay? So, what do you, we use in clinical routine echocardiography for? As I have said, this is our main, main standing. They, they say it's going to uh, substitute the, endoscope, the, the stethoscope, and uh, it has been really uh, replacing it quite a lot. So, as I have said, we use this for everything and any patient with suspected involvement of the heart. So, we can measure cardiac dimensions and motion. Uh, it's the technique of uh, imaging technique of choice in valve disease. So, the other techniques, as we will see, can do very well evaluating dimensions and motion of the heart, but there is no other technique as good as echocardiography to look for valve disease. We also use it to look at pericardial effusion and some pericardial diseases. Uh, it can be uh, the first imaging tool to detect intracardiac masses. We also use it, sorry, it's intracavitary. Uh, thanks to the, to the Doppler application and the, conver and the potential conversion into, uh, into pressure from velocities, applying a, a very simplified Bernoulli equation that we do, we can estimate intracavitary pressures. And this is very important, as I said before, because we used to do that with a catheter. We had to put a catheter to estimate pressures across a narrow or stenotic valve. Uh, and now we can do that with echocardiography. We also, as I have said, using contrast, we use echocardiography to diagnose intra or extracardiac uh, shunts. We also use echocardiography, at least as a first approach, to evaluate thoracic aortic disease. Also abdominal, but uh, typically thoracic aortic disease is evaluated with echocardiography. How do we evaluate uh, motion? As I have said, ventricle, left ventricle is the mo our big star in cardiology. The right ventricle is also important, but the big star is the left ventricle. And how do we evaluate its function? In reality, we do it very badly, but this is how we do. What we do <laughs> is how the left ventricle moves across the cardiac cycle. So typically we see how it moves, and we see the shape of the left ventricle, the dimension, and we evaluate if the motion is uniform across the, all the segments of the left ventricle. This is a normal heart, and this, of course, is a very, very abnormal heart. It becomes spherical, it becomes big, and the motion here becomes weird because it has something else, which is a LVBB, left bundle branch block, and has this septal flash, but if you look at this wall, this is moving very, very few, as, or very, very little motion as compared to this one. So we talk about normal motion, very reduced motion. And from here, what we typically do, we trace volumes from here with an estimation of an ellipsoid and we calculate ejection fraction or we just visually, in train eyes, we visually say, okay, this has an ejection fraction around 60%, this guy has an ejection fraction around 20%. We also have a look at segmental motion and let me point your view, your attention here. So if you look, the septum is still moving a little bit, not very normally, but a little bit. But if you compare the free wall of the right ventricle and you compare to the lateral wall of the left ventricle, this is completely akinetic. 
Okay, so this was a patient with a big infarction in the circumflex artery, which gives flow to this area of muscle in the left ventricle. So he had a lateral infarction, and this is how we detect this abnormal motion, uh, segmental abnormal motion of the ventricle. As I have said, we can also estimate pressures, and the most typical thing that we do, we estimate gradients across stenotic uh, valves. When you have a stenotic blood uh, valve, the flow increases velocity, and that uh, means that there is a gradient of pressures between the two cavities that are communicated by the valve. So if you have, for example, aortic stenosis, the left ventricle has to increase the pressure a lot above uh, the normal values to open a stenotic valve, okay? So then you have, through the whole uh, systole, you have a big gradient between the uh, left ventricle and the aortic valve. That's the main use of uh, continuous wave Doppler, but there is another use, which is estimating the pressure of the pulmonary artery pressure. And as again, we used to put a catheter into the pulmonary artery pressure to measure that. Now we estimate with echocardiography. And we do that because we can have the peak velocities of flows. You can calculate that, you can determine that using continuous wave Doppler. And from that, we make a transformation uh, because, because we use a simplified Bernoulli equation. You can discuss later on if this simplification is good enough or not, but it works um, not so bad in clinical practice. And if we have the difference between the right, uh, we have the difference in pressure, the gradients between the right ventricle and the right atrium, if we add the pressure of the right atrium to that, that in the absence of an stenotic pulmonic valve is exactly the same than the pressure in the pulmonary artery uh, in systole. So this is something that we do routinely. All the machines have a button where you put uh, maximum peak velocity of the tricuspid regurgitation, and then it calculates the estimation or it estimates pulmonary artery pressure. This is something that we do routinely, and indeed most of the cardiologists use it without knowing where is it based on. So this is what, how, how clinical work uh, works, or, or should not work, but. <laughs> um, why do we use this? Because most of us have a slight degree of tricuspid regurgitation. So we take advantage of this signal and we estimate pulmonary artery pressure. We can do that at rest or at exercise because we can also do exercise echo in some of these patients. As I, as I have said, we use echo mainly for bowel function. With echo, we can evaluate the morphology. This is an example of an aortic uh, valve which is bicuspid instead of the typical one, which is the most common one in the population, which is tricuspid. We can see how it opens and how is the flow across it, if it has high velocities because it is stenotic or if it has regurgitations because we see the color Doppler. And this is exactly what we do. We look at the opening. This is a mitral valve of a patient who had rheumatic fever and has some degree of stenosis of the mitral valve, which is abnormal. Look at this leaflet, it doesn't move at all. This one is thickened and it opens restrictively. So this is mitral stenosis. This is another example of a aortic valve. We are cutting the aortic valve transversally. So this should be three valves opening in systole and closing in diastole. And as you can see, there's a lot of white, which is calcium and there is no motion, almost no motion, maybe one leaflet is moving a little bit, but this is a very, very stenotic aortic valve. We look at gradients, as I have said, using continuous wave Doppler, and we look at color, looking is if there is any regurgitation. And this is most of the clinical echo we do. We look uh, at this area of regurgitation, how big it is, how large is it, within the, the receiving chamber, in this case, the right atrium. And with this, we first say regurgitation, yes or no. And secondly, we semi-quantitate how large or how big is this amount of regurgitation. We have other methods to try to quantify, but indeed for regurgitation, we don't have perfect methods to quantify regurgitation. 
We can also evaluate valve prosthesis. This is an example of three-dimensional echocardiography. This was a patient with mitral valve disease who had replaced his mitral valve and they put a mechanical prosthesis, which is made by a stent of uh, titanium and then two MEDs that move across this hinge point, uh, opens and, and closes in, in systole. You can see nicely the sutures of the surgeon made, so you can check if he did it a good job or not. We can also apply color, and this is really useful to look where the um, abnormal flows come from. So for example, here we have this regurgitation, which is completely normal in a mechanical prosthesis. And we also can evaluate pathology. For example, here we see a prosthesis in the mitral position, two emides. We see one emides moving here, but the other is fixed by a, by a mass here. So we can diagnose problems also with the valve, with the prosthetic valve here. What we are not good with echo is at telling, okay, what is this mass? So we can say this is a mass, but we, can, we are not good at saying what, what is this mass made of. So is this a thrombus? Is this a tumor? Is this uh, infection and we have purulin material here? We are not good at, with echocardiography at looking at the tissue, at the characterization of, of tissue. There has been some uh, attempts to do that using backscatter techniques, but really it doesn't work very well with echocardiography. So what we rely on to say this must be thrombus, this must be infection, is on the clinical presentation of the patient, on the clinical records, and also on the morphology, on the aspect. But really looking at this, this is more bright, less bright, this must be that, is not good with echocardiography. Uh, similar, uh, what, what we can, what, what we use very much echocardiography, and really we don't have any other technique so precise to that is in endocarditis. Endocarditis, as Bar said, is an infection of the valves of the heart. Valves or other devices that are in the heart, like electrodes, for example, there can be infection of intracardiac structures. And endocarditis is an infection starting on the valves, typically, that can destroy the tissue of the valves, which is the case. This is the aortic valve. So this aortic valve was destroyed, and even uh, it can extend to the annulus and destroy the annulus. So this aortic valve was kind of being dissected from the content of the, of the aortic wall and having very, very important complications with the aortic regurgitation and some dissections or descents of the valve here. So a cardiography is used to look at these small structures, which are called vegetations. Vegetations are made of mate purulent material, uh, consequence of the infection of the valves, and this is one of the points for the diagnosis of endocarditis. Again, we cannot say for sure this is infectious material, because we don't have this tissue characterization, but again, the clinical context and the clinical presentation of the patients support the diagnosis that we made with echocardiography. And finally, for echocardiography, we can, as I have said, we can use uh, it to look at the uh, aortic, uh, thoracic aorta diseases, particularly dissection. In dissection, the inner part of the aorta, which is called the adventitia, uh, the intima, is uh, separated uh, from the rest of the wall of the aorta, and we have a typical image which is called this flap here, which is the intima, the broken intima uh, of the aortic wall, and this makes even with holes that connect what we call the true lumen of the aorta within the false lumen. We can see this very nicely with echocardiography. We can also see that with MRI and CT, as we will see. But in some emergency settings, this is uh, the image that we, we, we choose of choice. And particularly for the ascending aorta, we use that to see if this dissection is involving the valve or not, which is important in terms when you have to operate the patient, you need to know, the surgeon needs to know if the valve is working or not. So we have many applications of echocardiography, but the most important thing is that echocardiography can be performed at the bedside of the patient. 
And this is really, really important because we have other techniques that we will see now with much nicer images, with much more three-dimensional information, but they cannot be done at the, at the beds of the, of the patient. And this is important because echocardiography is being more and more used in, um, in ICUs, in EORs, and it's the imaging uh, tool of choice to help uh, other physicians to perform their treatments, like surgeons, cardiac surgeons, or any surgery that may pose the, the heart into trouble, like long digestive car uh, surgeries, or as I have said before, in the interventional laboratory, uh, either for electrophysiology procedures or either for uh, valve procedures, which need somebody who guides him uh, within uh, the heart. Also, we have this very, very miniatur um, miniaturized, so this is what we call pocket echo. These are still limited uh, machines, so they cannot do all the modalities that we have been discussing. They do color Doppler and B-dimensional Doppler, but this is really useful in clinical practice because you have the patient there in one shot. You can tell a lot of things to your patient if this is performed in the wood hands. Uh, we also use that for a screening of some patients, for example, for aortic aneurysm screening. Family doctors are being trained to, to, to look at it. Very easy things with a really, really small uh, machine that can provide you lots of information. Another modality, as very quickly, that we use in cardiography is to look at the heart under different conditions. And the main conditions that we use for the heart are to stress the heart, okay? What happens to the heart if I stress? And how do we stress the heart? We have two ways of stressing the heart. Indeed, we give uh, drugs that stress the heart or we do exercise. The main objective uh, in most of the patients is to look for ischemia. You know, ischemia can be provoked, uh, and as this is the most prevalent disease, this is the main indication of stress echocardiography. But we are using more and more to evaluate patients with valve disease, with shorten of breath, even athletes. So what we do is we provoke a stress to the heart, and then we see how it responds. We have uh, pharmacological stress echocardiography, and this is an example. The typical drug that we use is dobutamine. Dobutamine does several effects on the heart. Uh, it increases heart rate and it increases contractility. So the normal response of a heart, of a normal heart to dobutamine, would be to increase its heart rate and to increase its contractility. And this is what happens in this patient. This is baseline. This is 10 micrograms, 20 and 30 micrograms of dobutamine, which is a really high dose. And you can see how the, the heart increases uh, the heart rate, but also increases contractility, so the cavity collapses during systole. In this case, we added contrast to improve visualization of the endocardium. Another example is a stress uh, exercise echocardiography. These are images, uh, sorry. These are images at, at rest, and after exercise, I hope it doesn't stop, but you can see that here the apex should close, and it's persist open, a kinetic indeed. So this patient started to run on the treadmill and said, my chest is uh, pain, I have pain in my on my chest. The ECG show some very important changes on the ECG, and we saw this abnormal segmental motion of the apex. So we suspected this patient had important coronary artery disease, which was confirmed on the coronary angiography. So, in summary, echocardiography, before going quickly to the other techniques, is a quick, easy, available technique, imaging technique. We need to improve some things, some artifacts. We had no time to go very much on some artifacts that we get, particularly for mechanical devices, leads, prosthesis, or even the bobby that we use in the ward. They do a lot of artifact on, the, on ultrasound, and that doesn't allow us to make an accurate evaluation. We need to improve a spatial resolution, particularly when we are using three-dimensional echo. Temporal resolution is 
quite good as compared to other techniques, but if we want to do to study very, very quick things that happen in the myocardial cycle, like myocardial deformation, we need to improve it also. Uh, we need to improve a little bit on the measurement of intracardiac pressures and dynamics. We have the information there. For example, we have color Doppler within the left ventricle. We could indeed calculate how pressures within the left ventricle are, and there are some research studies made on that, but still it's very far away from clinical practice. Uh, we have a big limitation with tissue characterization and a big limitation also with myocardial perfusion. So for this, we have other methods, other techniques that we don't use so much in clinical routine. Uh, these techniques have, are cardiac CT and MRI. They have the big advantage that they have a high spatial resolution, so pictures look great, but they still have lower temporal resolution. And also our big limitation is availability and portability. So you have to send your very sick patient to the city, which is typically downstairs in radiology or to the MRI. And I do an echo in five minutes. The MRI takes, if we are going quick, at least 30 minutes. And if you have a very, very sick patient, intubated, ventilated, it's difficult to do that. And also we have the problem of radiation for cardiac CT. What do we use these techniques for? Mainly for aortic pathology. So we can see very nice the aorta in all its extension, uh, all the thoracic aorta and also abdominal. We use particularly MRI for the right ventricle evaluation. Uh, right ventricle is in a structure that it's difficult to evaluate because it has a complex geometry uh, with two parts and it's difficult to see it either with 2D and 3D echo. We use MRI particularly is our imaging of choice to evaluate tissue characterization. It's good at detecting scar, uh, looking at fibrosis, and it's getting better and better to look not only at cicatricial or replacement fibrosis, but also interstitial fibrosis. And it's also good to differentiate fat from thrombus or other, other tissues. Uh, we use CT for non-invasive coronary angiography. And we also use MRI, particularly some work starting with CT, but particularly MRI for myocardial perfusion. So we combine MRI with the stress. Here uh, we use mainly drugs. We use adenosine. Uh, and we look at myocardial perfusion with specific sequ sequences for MRI. So these are examples of uh, aortic disease. You can see here the flap of a dissection of a patient with an aortic aneurysm. We can evaluate right ventricle, right ventricle uh, motion, morphology very nicely with, left, with MRI and also, of course, the left ventricle. It's difficult to have this definition of this aneurysm here in the infralateral wall of the left ventricle with echocardiography. We can have a hint, but definitely the definition or the spatial uh, resolution is much better with MRI. And of course, as we have 3D volume uh, data sets, we are much better quantifying uh, data from MRI than from echocardiography. CT is also very good, at this, it is based on X-rays. It's very good to depict calcification. This is important, for example, when we have to operate a patient and we want to see how is his aorta, or we have doubts about the aortic valve uh, disease severity, for example, we look at calcification and CT is the technique of choice for that. As I have said, MRI is very good at characterizing uh, tissues, particularly the left ventricle myocardium because it has uh, enough thickness to be a scan. We are working on the atria and on the right ventricle, but definitely using contrast, which is another contrast, gadolinium, it's very good at looking at scars to see the extent of scars, and also research is being done on trying to characterize the tissue within the scar. Also, there are new sequences that not only look at the scar or replacement fibrosis that we call, uh, that they look at interstitial fibrosis, which is a prior state of disease before, sometimes even before left ventricular dysfunction or ventricular dysfunction occurs. 
And finally, coronary angiography. Typically, we do that putting a, ca a catheter on the aorta. In most of the patients, we do this way, invasively. Why? Because then we can put the catheter inside the coronary and put a stent or treat coronary stenosis. But in those patients where we think we are not going to treat because we think very much that they are going to have normal arteries or we want to do a follow-up, what we can do is a non-invasive uh, coronary angiography, which is done with multi-slice CT. You know, it's CT with a lot of rows, and we can have very nice images now of the coronary arteries non-invasive. Just two slides about nuclear scintigraphy. Nuclear scintigraphy is just the imaging that we have with a gamma camera uh, in a patient that we have given uh, a label uh, particles that fix to the myocardium. Typically, we use that uh, for assessing ischemia of the heart, for, for assessing perfusion. And again, we stress the heart with exercise or giving drugs, the butamine or adenosine, depending on the, on the center. And what we do is we compare the images at baseline and during exercise. Uh, lately, we can have also images gated with the ECG and we ha can have also motion. So we can combine with this uh, imaging technique motion and perfusion. Uh, this is mainly used for perfusion, despite MRI is gaining more and more uh, fill uh, in this indication, because this has the problem again of radiation. So we are using less and less, but still use a lot for testing for ischemic heart disease. Another advantage of this is that we can, or with other techniques, that we can fuse uh, two imaging modalities. This is an example of fusing CT coronary angiogram and perfusion imaging by nuclear. But we use every day in the EP lab, for example, in the electrophysiology lab, we fuse images from the MR and also from the navigator system. This is non, this is invasive imaging, but these are other ways to work, like fusing, putting the good things of every, every house into a single shot. So what we would like you to do, indeed, is that we got this perfect imaging tool that we still don't have. As I have said, the most uh, useful or the, the one that we use routinely is echocardiography, but has important limitations that are partially provided by the other ones, particularly MRI for tissue characterization and for perfusion, but still we need to improve. We need ideally harmless, uh, which is widely available and inexpensive. So these are conditions uh, for echocardiography. This is why it's so successful, but we need to have high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. And echocardiography is not that good, particularly at spatial resolution has to be able to characterize dynamics and tissue composition. We are improving. We are quite good uh, at dynamics with echocardiography, quite, not perfect yet, and quite good about tissue composition with MRI, but we don't have in one technique. We need it to be easy to quantify because we have many patients waiting, many patients to be diagnosed, and always busy cardiology departments. We have to avoid artifacts, and this is it. So I hope you can work a lot, and in some few years, have these more advanced imaging modalities. Thank you very much for your attention. Is this work? Yeah. Thank you very much. Just, just a brief question, because most of the engineers, when we start working with or talking to cardiologists, we start to do modeling and things like that, and we say like, okay, we obviously need a 3D MRI or 3D CT in order to do it, because otherwise we cannot work. And which percentage of patients do you think these are available in, in routine clinical practice? 5%. So we need to work with ultrasound in reality. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so this was a very, very clinical talk in the sense that this is our routine. So if you see, my talk was like 90% echocardiography and 10% uh, CT and MR. And this is reality. This is uh, real cardiology. Of course, for research, we do MRI, and it will be more and more. But also availability of MRI machines is not that good in all cardiac centers. So you have to think that our big tool is echo. 
Of course, we need to improve on MRI because we have to incorporate and do many things with that, but reality is... And maybe a bit more philosophical or practical question for some people in the room. It's like, say somebody develops a nice modeling tool and say, like, okay, this is better than the, what you use. Will you buy it as a clinical cardiology? <laughs> we we don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> No. So, <laughs> how do you think we can get our tools at some point in clinical reality? Because in reality, it's indeed, you go to cardiologists, they don't want to pay. But how do you proceed? Yeah, I mean, the thing is really that, that we, we, mm, we work much together, no? Because it's the same thing that I was saying with the statisticians, no? Uh, okay, it's like the thing, ejection fraction, okay, it doesn't work. We know it has a lot of limitations, but in the end, uh, this is what we use, and it's... Okay, so they, they need to, uh, we need to know what you are able to do and you need to know what we really need and, and you need to learn medicine, that's it. I mean, it's important that you <laughs> learn medicine and that you read and that you go to clinical sessions to really understand what are the real problems because unfortunately, theory is here and practice is there and that's life. I mean, I think it's every, everywhere the same. Any other questions? Well, it's um, a little bit of a follow-up, but if you're looking for a new tool, um, is it a new tool or is it more likely that it might be a combination of tools that already exist, mainly because, of course, the financial part, you don't have to buy new equipment if it's already there. Would it be possible to combine, not just in um, the analysis and retrospect, but also just in a combination of different techniques at the same time to, for example, solve the temporal and the spatial resolution, something like that? Mm, well, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, in terms of uh, time, I think that if you go from what you have and you improve what you have, it's quicker. Uh, if you want to go to a unique tool that does everything, I think that that's going to be tough, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think. But I mean, there are many things to do with the information we have. For example, intraventricular gradients is something that we have been talking a lot, not so that uh, in 2000, I was, I remember um, some authors already writing papers on this, and that's something that it seems easy, and but the companies were not interested in this because what does it, what do they sell? Nice pictures. And in the end, okay, these are nice pictures, but what do you use it for, no? So it's a trade-off and this, this thing is going to be difficult to do if we do not interact more than we do. And for that, I mean, if you want to sell, okay, nice pictures will sell much better, we know that. <laughs> but in the end, we need useful things because we have lots of examples of nice pictures that haven't been there for like 3D volumes from ECHO. I mean, 3D volumes, okay, but in yeah. the end, we so don't I use guess, so much. I guess integration of new things in the current clinical routine is, I think, the most important. No? Yeah. It's like if you do something which is totally separate from clinical routine, acceptance will be extremely low. If you can add on there, it will be much easier to get into some of these things. Yeah, and also you need to, to make it... Um, it's, it's, uh, you need to make it also easy to understand. No? For example, DTI was a nice example no, of something that can give you a lot of information, but most of the physicians, they don't understand and they don't pay attention to it. So you need to find, I mean, we are simple people. <laughs> so we, we, we are always kind of saving lives. No? So we need, we need th simple things and easy to use, because if not, it's going to be dead again. Um, hi, um, first of all, thank you for the talk, very interesting. My field is um, cardiopulmonary bypass. So regarding monitoring of microemboli, is echocardiography the best or the most mostly used tool or is there any, during surgery? There have been some attempts to use, because during pulmonary car, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, you can only use echo, okay? And there have been some attempts looking at myocardial perfusion with contrast, but uh, that's another field <laughs> to work. We are not sure if the bubbles are so uh, um, 
harmless to the myocardium. So, but maybe something working on strain and, and a myocardial deformation would be good to monitor because the problem during cardiopulmonary bypass is the, the status of the myocardium. Okay, is that what you're working or not? I'm or in the no, pulmonary? I'm, start, I'm starting more, more the, the optimization pulmon? of the oxygenators. Oh, okay, okay. I'm not so expert in, in lung perfusion and I'm not so aware on that, but maybe I don't know. There, I know that there's been some work performed in, in, in lung tissue characterization, uh, particularly for looking at the edema. So maybe it's something that you can apply, but uh, I'm sorry I cannot help with the lung perfusion. <laughs> it's not my field. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. For the sake of time, or oh, was there still? Okay, one last question. Hi, again, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question regarding um, modeling and image analysis because uh, Bart was talking before about um, doing some kind of patient specific modeling and how does that, how is it used really in the clinic? So, can you? easily combine the two techniques and take images from the patients and do some kind of patient-specific modeling to better study the disease, or is it not yet being used? So in, indeed, this is a, another example, no? So you have injuries coming saying, okay, I'm going to model this, and you will plan your, your uh, treatment and these things. I think it's a good idea, but still we have a long way to do. So. Now what we are using modeling sometimes is to better understand pathophysiology and then translate that into clinical practice. So the translation of modeling into clinical practice, I think is still a little far away. I mean, we should do that to understand much more pathophysiology and this is how we usually work. And then in the planning of therapies, it's still not so clear, at least in cardiology. I know other specialties, like for example, maxillo, uh, maxillar surgery, they are very, very away, uh, ahead. But in cardiology, still, mm, it's still difficult. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. In the sake of time, I think we continue. Thank you very much for coming.